All right, so going over that again, I'm glad to be here, glad to have a working presentation, glad to be audible, and glad to talk about building better models. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of a perspective from a few years ago. I'm gonna guess that many of you read XKCD. For those of you who don't, I'm gonna give you a minute. All right, so this comic was written about five years ago, making predictions about things you could do with a research team and five dedicated years of hard work. And at the time it was written, it was true enough to be funny. Maybe it still is now. But regardless, the prediction was that figuring out whether a photograph contained a bird was a serious research question. And that was true in 2014. In 2019, just a couple of months ago, I sat in on a lecture for bright undergraduates at a summer school at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And in the first lecture of this summer school, the students learned to classify not one, but 200 types of birds. They did this using a library called FastAI, which sits on about five years worth of work by machine learning researchers, Python library developers, and undoubtedly data managers and bird photographers. This new classification scheme they used is possible because of the last five years worth of advances in machine learning. So just to warm everybody up here at 9 a.m. on the first day of a conference, can I get a couple of shows of hands for people who are familiar with the term machine learning? Great. All right, and how many of you have used it in your work? All right, are there any people in here who would like to use it in their work but haven't found a, a good use case? All right, looks like we've got a good mix. So I'm gonna be spending this talk going over examples of what I think are exciting advances in machine learning, mostly from the last couple of years, and how these apply to different types of Earth system modeling. And the goal of this is that at whatever step in that show of hands you were at, I'm going to give you the tools to move you a little bit further through. So first off, um, the definition of machine learning that I'm going to be using is that machine learning is the practice of using algorithms to parse data, learn from it, and then make a prediction about something out in the world. And um, as many of you will know, this definition encompasses both traditional statistics like polynomial regression and classification, um, tools like support vector machines, neural networks, and other tools coming out of artificial intelligence. In the last few years, advances in deep learning and convolutional neural networks, which will form a lot of the basis in this talk. And then even more recent techniques like generative adversarial networks, unsupervised learning, and transfer and reinforcement learning. The reason I'm giving you this talk is that a lot of trends have arisen in the worlds of computing and Earth system modeling that make machine learning particularly relevant now. The first of these, in case it didn't show up in the XKCD, is that machine learning is creating solutions to problems that used to be intractable. And this includes a lot of problems in image recognition, like the birds, a lot of problems in natural language processing, and also a lot of things to do with the analysis of large volumes of high dimensional data, which is something that we have a lot of in Earth system modeling and weather and climate science in general. In the last few years, maybe 10 years, maybe a little bit more in this case, we've gained access to enormous new streams of data. This particular case is an example from NASA showing observational data about carbon dioxide production in yellow and vegetation in green around the world, observed on a daily basis through remote sensing. We're also revealing parts of the world that we didn't have enough data about. Here is a LIDAR map of Antarctica from the Antarctic DEM and the U US's contribution to the geophysical polar year in 2016. This is a, a very detailed map of a place that we didn't even know was a continent until a few decades ago. 
And then finally, we have enormous amounts of data in the form of climate models. At the moment, we're going on a few petabytes of data stored in things like the Climate Model Intercomparison Project. And we're also producing more large ensembles of different models, which are important for exploring uncertainty quantification and parameterization questions. So with all of these sources of data, we're looking for tools that can use them and that can integrate these sources of data into our models. The final trend that I'd like to bring up here as an introduction is in high performance computing. From about 1965 to the mid 2000s, computing power doubled about every five years. This is known as Moore's Law. It was very convenient. My laptops got old. I could buy new ones for the same price just by waiting. The same thing applied to supercomputing and um, also trickled down into software development and the capability to design software that was too big for current computers and trust that within a few years the computational resources were going to catch up and that software would be usable on the same architectures that this had already used. Many of you will know this trend is coming to an end due to both limitations on the size of transistor chips and heat dissipation on those. Chips are no longer doubling in power every five years. Unfortunately, our desire to keep having software that grows at the same rate hasn't really tapered off. The ways that we can deal with this include increasing the number of cores on a machine. And this is something we're gonna be talking about a lot in this workshop. It comes up in many types of parallelism. And part of what's going to come up are the difficulties with parallelism. Because no matter what you do, your parallel performance asymptotes somewhere, often with things like Earth system modeling, not where you want it to asymptote to as the code performance gets bottlenecked by unparallelizable components. We can keep pushing performance by introducing heterogeneous hardware. This is Summit, the supercomputer at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, I believe either recently or still the largest in the world. And it has about 9,000 multi-core CPUs and 27,000 GPUs. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the GPUs because we're going to have a talk later this morning from an NVIDIA, NVIDIA representative going into, I presume, much more detail. But um, I'd like to point out that they're good for some problems, but not many in our system modeling, or not all. They're good for things like dense matrix math, but not sparse matrix math or lo loosely coupled systems of a large number of kinds. And they're very good at neural networks of many types. So one of the advantages of using neural networks in earth system modeling is that we have the potential to take components of our code and make them easier and smoother to move over onto GPUs. And this is going to keep coming up later in this session. We've got a talk this afternoon on porting codes over to GPUs, which will go into some of the technical difficulties that we have now. And uh, the other advantage of machine learning is that it's not just for codes that we have now, but also for the, co for the uh, codes and architectures we're going to have in the next few years. Google has recently produced a TensorFlow processing unit um, this is futuristic only in the sense of Earth system modeling. They're available now on Google Cloud. And they are advertised as being a few tens of times faster than GPUs for training neural networks and solving other machine learning problems. Coming up in the further future, IBM is developing a, ch clip, a chip called True North, which is meant to be similar to the structure of the brain or at least to the structure of a convolutional neural network. And these are now being tested and prototyped at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and will presumably lead to even further speed ups once they're released and adopted. So um, using these technologies, designing models for machine learning, specifically for neural networks, means that we're designing them to take advantage of the hardware we have now and the hardware that's coming in in the future. I'm gonna go into some examples of what we can do with machine learning in just a moment. But first I wanna give you a little bit about my perspective because I'm not going to get a chance to cover the entire field here 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about why I picked the examples that I did. So, uh, so I've spent much of my time here in Boulder working on snow science, specifically the way that the wind blows snow around through the mountains and how it organizes. This involves a little bit of sitting around in videos, setting up equipment like these time-lapse cameras, and modern science being what it is, a lot of time programming models and trying to get those to run efficiently at scales that are big enough to actually predict something interesting. In the modeling world, a lot of what I've been focused on is finding models that can accurately represent what we understand about the Earth system model. And this comes up a lot in snow science when you start looking at the bridge between Earth system modeling, which looks at the Arctic on 10 to 30 or bigger kilometer grid cells, versus the snow we have here, which is enormously heterogeneous on scales as small as 10 centimeters or a meter. And so I spend a lot of my time with Earth system modeling thinking about ways to represent that small scale heterogeneity or capture the spirit of it in larger models. The second trend informing what I'm going to talk about here is the climate. At present, the Earth's climate has warmed by about one degree Celsius over pre-industrial levels, and we've released enough greenhouse gases to lock in warming up to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is starting to hit the threshold where the IPCC thinks we're going to have very serious consequences. Even that is contingent on phasing out greenhouse gas emissions over the next 50 years, which may or may not happen in practice. So when I think about Earth and climate modeling, I think about creating tools to help people who are trying to mitigate carbon change and greenhouse gas emissions do so in efficient ways. And I think about tools to help individuals, local governments, companies, other kinds of decision makers adapt to changes that we know are coming. So this paper here is the result of an interdisciplinary effort, I think it was mentioned briefly in the introduction, to introduce a lot of climate change problems to the machine learning community and get them excited about reducing greenhouse gases and helping people adapt to climate change. And I'm gonna be bringing up this project uh, a few times throughout the talk as we start talking about ways to bridge gaps between machine learning and earth system modeling, and in particular, ways to bring more machine learning expertise into our community. The problems that I talk about with this in mind are gonna be focused on impact. And I'm going to be talking about problems where there's a clear path from research to implementation to deployment in models that people use and that have the potential to reach climate decision makers. So with that in mind, I'm gonna go through a few examples of ways that we can use machine learning to under build better Earth system models. This is gonna be, by talking about better, I'm talking about solving long-standing problems in terms of accuracy, speed, or implementation, talking about integrating new streams of satellite or other observational data into models in smoother ways, and also taking advantage of new GPU and future-based computing hardware. The particular examples that I pick out are also coming up in the last couple of years specifically. This doesn't represent anything close to the full history of the field of statistical and machine learning methods for Earth system modeling, um, but just a, a small selection of what's come up in about the last year and a half. So I wanna start off by talking about clouds. And clouds are important because they're currently the largest source of uncertainty in Earth system models. They can be very bright and reflect sunlight back into space, and they can be very dark and absorb it and warm the Earth. They're also typically very subgrid scale as far as Earth system models are concerned. So the, the first project that I want to introduce is here by um, Tianle Yuan at NASA Goddard, who's been working on using machine learning to detect clouds in satellite imagery. And what you can see here is uh, brightness temperature from MODIS imagery on the left, and on the right is a mask applied by a deep convolutional neural network, which extracts certain areas of clouds. And these clouds, in particular, are anthropogenic clouds. When ships move across the ocean, they release aerosols. And these aerosols cause, ex cause um, additional condensation of water droplets in the air, 
and lead to cloud formation. In a, a piece of parallel work, this project has also been pursued by a group at the University of Oxford, who's been using it to detect um, both pockets where marine clouds are dissipated by precipitating out earlier than those around them, as well as ship tracks in many parts of the, the global oceans. And again, you can see MODIS data on the left, a hand-drawn ground truth in the middle, and then a mask generated by a deep learning network over on the right. And you'll note that the, the bottom right picture actually shows a few tracks that didn't really get picked up in the hand-drawn image buried in, in some of the complex parts of that picture. And I think this work is, this, so these, these pieces of work are important for our understanding of clouds. They've turned out the fact that in major shipping centers like the California coastline, up to 10% of marine clouds are actually caused by anthropogenic perturbations like these. They're important for learning about the global shipping network. And they also have a few fun side effects, um, like detecting ships sailing around North Korea that don't show up on international shipping logs. This is a, a relatively, in a sense, this is a relatively expected use of machine learning. It's image recognition. We have satellite imagery widely available through MODIS, and we can extract interesting things from it. I want to spend most of this time talking about applications that are centered more in the Earth system modeling domain and that move a little bit beyond image recognition and natural language processing and the things we might think of when we think about machine learning. So following up on the cloud theme, once we know where clouds are and what they're doing on the small scale, we still have to represent them in large scale models. And there's been a lot of great work on this front in the last couple of years by groups at uh, UC Irvine and I believe MIT. So when I think of a cloud in an Earth system model, I think about a big block, kind of like this. And it might have thin clouds and thick clouds and gaps in between. But fundamentally, a lot of things are represented in terms of a tracer within a large grid cell or cover fractions. This isn't just clouds. I also think of this in the polar area, for example, with sea ice, where up close, you see lots of ridges, you see lots of leads, fragmentation, windblown snow heterogeneously distributed around. And when you re represent it in an Earth system model, all of these factors get represented as area cover fractions, losing a lot of information about geometry, which in reality is one of the features that really informs the physics of what's happening. So with clouds, we can get into more detailed physics. There are cloud resolving models. They're known as super parameterized models, but they're also really expensive because clouds are full of expensive thermodynamics that happens on relatively fast scales. A group led by UC Irvine has been working on taking these super parameterized models and training neural networks to approximate them with the advantage that the neural network runs about 20 times faster than the model with the super parameterized cloud, at least as far as the, the parameterization scheme is concerned. And this works pretty well. One of the things that I really like about this project is that the group immediately tested it out in the community atmospheric model, which many of you likely know if you think here. And um, what you can see is that we have the super parameterized um, ground truth model on the left, the model with a deep neural network representing clouds in the middle, and then on the far your right, um, we have a control model with a standard parameterization. And what you can see is that the neural network is successfully capturing a lot of the big features of the super parameterized network. It's running about 20 times faster, and in terms of both pressure and the temperature difference, it's a lot closer to the ground truth case. This theme of taking a expensive piece of an Earth system model and emulating it with a neural network is not unique to clouds. It's potentially applicable to many computational bottlenecks or many problems where we have a model that we can treat as ground truth and a model that we trust, and it's difficult to deploy in global climate models because of the computational expense. Moving on to another example. Um, this is a project that won the Gordon Bell Prize back in 2018. 
It's not really a back, that's still pretty recent. Um, but they're talking about exascale deep learning for climate analytics, and specifically for taking climate model data, again, from the community atmospheric model, and running it forward for about 100 years and detecting extreme events like atmospheric rivers and like tropical cyclones. And for this project, they started with about 60,000 examples of these atmospheric events detected by, an, again, a trusted but more expensive piece of software. And they trained a deep neural network to build masks, which segment the pixels in the total global model into pixels which are background, cyclone, or river. And this project, uh, in particular, forecasts about 100 years into the future can ideally be used to figure out how things like rates of precipitation and storm frequency will change, intensify, or migrate geographically in different regions over time, and has also attracted a lot of attention for actually using all 27,000 GPUs on Oak Ridge's Summit machine, and thereby winning prizes in supercomputing. The, the other thing about this particular piece of work that I think is cool is that since releasing their data set containing all of the atmospheric rivers and cyclones that they've detected, they've spawned a lot of work, a lot of conference and workshop papers by other groups within the machine learning community who are also taking a look at this data set and using it to solve new problems. In particular, things that come up with this have to do with imbalanced data sets, which is a natural characteristic of extreme events, where you have a large data set and by their very nature, a very small fraction of the things inside of it are going to be extreme cyclones. Moving on a little bit further, I'm gonna talk about a little bit more of my own work and interests here. There's been a lot of work in the last few years in predicting spatiotemporal patterns with machine learning. And the eminent and most straightforward example of this is video prediction. So what you can see here is an example from a paper back in 2016 talking about several machine learning approaches to predicting videos. And up at the top, I'm gonna take the second one because I'm kind of short, um, you can see four input frames showing, in this case, a bunch of pool balls starting to move around we have a ground truth example with where they actually go. And then we have the results of neural networks trained on two different objective functions, L1 and L2 norms for the pixels. Um, and, um, and then an adversarial result where the, machine where the uh, frames are tested against a second neural network, which is trying to distinguish between the ground truth and the production of the original one. And the, the takeaway here is that video prediction has actually gotten pretty sharp. You can see that using the naive L1 and L2 norms, you get a very blurry image. But then using the, the more state-of-the-art generative adversarial network result, you get something that's starting to really look like those pool balls within the realm of uncertainty of where things may actually go. And I think this is a really interesting trend because a lot of problems in Earth system modeling, whether in climate science, look a lot like video prediction problems. We have a lot of data that is spatiotemporal and exists on a few channels, kind of analogous to color. Moving out of the weather domain a little bit, but one of these that I've been interested in recently is sand dunes, a preeminent problem in organized spatiotemporal patterns in general. This particular image is from the Navajo Nation in the southwestern United States. It's where um, in the last few years, increased desertification and long-term droughts have been releasing a lot of once stable sand up into the wind, where it forms dunes and threatens roads, houses, and grazing land. This is a fairly common problem. About 5% of the world's total surface is covered by sand dunes. And all, most of these areas are expanding due to global warming-induced desertification. Unfortunately, existing models of sand dunes are about fast enough to predict the motion of these dunes for about the next year, maybe just long enough for the people living here to start making some changes in their infrastructure. Um, 
And that's about what you could predict in a couple of days worth of runtime of an existing sand dune model. So it's very limited when you have a problem that's affecting 5% of the Earth's surface. So what I've been working on on this front is testing whether we can treat some of these sand dune models as image data. In this case, the first four images, there's one example on the left, one on the right, are elevation data showing the shapes of dunes over time. In this case, separated by a period of about two months each frame. And you can see them moving forward. And then using the video prediction algorithm presented on the previous slide to try to advance it further forward still. And these are preliminary results. They look a little bit blurry. I look at them and I wonder whether the, whether the deep learning algorithm or the generative adversarial network in this case has actually learned what the dunes are doing or just learned to shift them a little bit downwind. But we still have a lot of, tr of simulated training data to go and I think this is going to keep improving. In the meantime, whatever accuracy it achieves, it's achieving at a computational speed about 10 million times faster than the previous model once trained, which is about the difference between those few sand dunes and the entire 70,000 kilometers square of the Navajo Nation. So potentially, this scales up the models that we're working on from something that we can use to answer scientific questions and solve very isolated case studies to something that we can use to make global natural hazard predictions. I don't want to talk about exciting applications, however, as if we can solve everything with machine learning. There are still a lot of barriers to implementation. There are a lot of technical barriers and a lot of expertise that's needed to implement new algorithms, much of which is still relatively missing and in high demand in the overall economy, although later on I'll be talking about resources where you can start building that expertise in yourselves or in your research groups. There are also a lot of social barriers, which I'm gonna be talking about more here. Some of these are cultural. They come up in what gets people excited and what gets people motivated enough to solve a problem really well. So if, why don't we take a moment for you to stop and think about a problem that last got you interested. I'm gonna give you a few seconds. Maybe something that you were willing to work on on the weekends or something that had you excited to come into work. I see some smiles. All right, I'm gonna ask for a couple of shows of hands about where that bit of seed of excitement comes from. And you can put your hand up many times because I'm not gonna give you a list of options ahead of them. How many of you are thinking about a programming problem? A clever solution to something you have. All right, that is well represented in this audience. What about a scientific problem? A how or a why? How does this affect that? All right, also pretty good. What about something motivated by a method? Gosh, I just have to try that new tool. All right, and then what about something motivated by data? Gosh, I really need to do something with this. All right. So we've got some representation in every category there. Does anybody feel really underrepresented still? Okay. So in this audience, the smallest group that we had was actually for the data side of things. And in my experience, when I want to go to someone who's got a background in machine learning and I want to get them excited about a problem, the first question they ask me is, okay, what data set do you have? And the second question is, okay, how big is it? And there's a right answer here. If your data set is 100 data points, that's the end of the conversation in, in many examples. And once you start getting up to maybe a terabyte, maybe a few terabytes, people start getting really excited. This is a little bit of a different motivation than what we have in the room. And that creates a little bit of a cultural barrier, one of several. And I am generalizing terrifically here. So I want you to take all of this with a grain of salt, a couple of grains of salt for any of it. But this is a, a bit of a framework to start thinking about ways that we can bridge these barriers and start implementing new things that are going to work and that are going to gather excitement from multiple communities. So the first one up at the top, talking about motivations. 
there are motivations that come out of scientific questions and out of data. And following that, there are changes in people's objectives. A lot of machine learning techniques, in particular deep learning in general, rest on the assumption that you can do something interesting by taking a data set and using it to train a model that will optimize for some well-defined quantitative objective function. And this is very different from the paradigm we use when we're doing science, where we tend to start with much broader questions, like can I build a good model of this phenomenon? Can I make a, a deliverable for someone else in my chain? Can I find an exciting question, like what's going to happen when all the sea ice in the Arctic melts? How will that affect the rest of the globe? Coming with these, we have differences in the importance of explainability. I hear a lot of people in the geoscience sphere talk about machine learning algorithms as black boxes, which are difficult to explain, and that this makes them somewhat antithetical to scientific methods that we commonly use that rep rest on understood principles like thermodynamics and conservation of mass or energy. This difference is changing. There's a lot of ongoing research in what's called interpretable machine learning and also in tools like sensitivity analyses for figuring out what machine learning algorithms, specifically again in this case, deep neural networks, are using to make their predictions. We're going to have a few talks in the rest of today about data and code. And some of the differences here are that ideally, many machine learning algorithms rest on having a cleanly labeled training data set, like future climate model predictions with accurately labeled tropical cyclones that you can go in and identify. Most of the tools that we have are developed for data formats like pandas data frames or images with their nice square three pixels. While in Earth system modeling, a lot of data standards are in terms of net CDFs, and a lot of data that we produce comes up on really irregular grids, either on a spherical globe or with something like the MPAS models on a Voronoi diagram, which is completely irregular and multi-resolution. In the, on the code front, a lot of existing libraries in machine learning are written in Python. There are some of them in R, there are some of them in Julia. A lot of high performance computing modelings in weather and climate science are written in C++ and Fortran for their high speed computational performance. I believe David John Gann is going to be talking later today about some of the barriers that come up here and that come up when you try to port tools written in Python into Fortran environments or sometimes vice versa. And then finally, there's a difference in rewards. A lot of machine learning advances are presented at conferences. In most of, of the geophysical sciences, conference presentations are a networking event, but not a formal publication, and people are really pushing for journal articles. And this may look like a relatively small barrier, but it crops up a lot in practice when interdisciplinary teams are trying to work together. And I would expect that a few of you may have run into this already in the working groups that you're part of here and elsewhere. So we've got a number of barriers here. And again, I'm not even really starting on the, the technical barriers in terms of developing machine learning expertise here. But we can start to remove some of these barriers. And another thing that makes the adoption of machine learning and weather and climate modeling timely is that there are a lot of ongoing efforts to take these barriers and start taking them down. One strategy is to build climate models that are ready to learn. And this is a figure taken from a, pa taken from a paper on Earth System Modeling 2.0 by a group called the Climate Modeling Alliance based out of Caltech. They're interested in building a climate model which is mostly driven by neural networks and which learns physics by emulating high resolution simulations, somewhat like we saw in the cloud example earlier, and that learns more, more parameters, data-driven components directly from satellite data. And that these feed continuously back into the model and shorten the loop between making an observation, generalizing that observation into a theory or a parameter, and implementing it in a model, into a model that learns continuously and improves as we continue to, le to learn more about the Earth. 
ideally, this strategy brings the big data that we have and turns it rapidly into scientific modeling and also removes some of the, t the, uh, the language and data format barriers that we were talking about by making a model where machine learning is an integral part of the framework. In practice, fundamentally, you get the advantages of building a climate model from the ground up by building a climate model from the ground up. And the ones that we already have are the, the pinnacle of some three odd decades worth of work by the atmospheric science and geoscience communities. And it may be a bit of a challenge. We'll see. Another strategy that's gained a lot of traction in the last couple of years is the creation of benchmark data sets. Here on the left, we have one from the Intelligent, Syst Intelligent Systems for Geosciences group, an NSM funded group. And they're working on creating a benchmark for the detection of methane in satellite observations. With the idea that if we can detect methane, a potent greenhouse gas, we can more effectively regulate and perhaps reduce it. The second image here is the extreme weight weather data set that was used in the uh, atmospheric river and cyclone tracking study earlier. And both of these benchmark data sets translate scientific problems into good conditions for machine learning research. By making the data big, by offering a well-defined target or objective, by finding a problem where prediction is important, and by getting all of the data management questions sorted out. This is a lot of work. There are a lot of pitfalls. There are a lot of problems that we're interested in where the data is just not available or where the, the objective cannot be well enough defined that you can guarantee that an algorithm meeting that objective will also meet a large scientific goal. But there are a number of growing initiatives to do this, again, through the Intelligent Systems for Geosciences, and some are starting to come out of NCAR and other organizations that will create these problems. They have a lot of nice side effects on machine learning research by bringing the energy of machine learning researchers to problems in geoscience and potentially directing that energy at types of data like extremely imbalanced data or partially labeled data or data with diverse and heterogeneous uncertainties into the sphere of things that machine learning researchers work on and potentially creating a pipeline to develop new and useful tools. The final set of initiatives I'm gonna talk about are human. I'm coming back to the group on climate change AI that I've been working with here. We've been working on getting machine learning people interested in climate change problems. And that means the general sphere, not just climate science, but also things like optimizing heating and cooling systems, or forecasting electricity demand, um, or implementing new types of precision agriculture. And um, bringing those people together with domain experts and giving them venues to share their work, be proud of their work, and be rewarded for it. I'm gonna talk about a few other con interdisciplinary conferences of this nature later. And the idea of this is that we can start bringing some of the values of those domain areas, the important problems, the motivating questions, and the large goals over into machine learning and create a setup where the ma machine learning people can work on things that have a lot of impact in other domains directly and deliberately. So far, this has met with a lot of enthusiasm from the machine learning community. I think a lot of people there are really looking for opportunities to apply the techniques and the expertise that they have to problems that they think are motivating and that they think are important. This still leaves a lot of scope for refining the definition of an important problem and finding problems where outside domain expertise is important and necessary and going to be useful. So I wanna round out the talk here by talking about next steps. And this is a good time to get your phones out because there are gonna be a few lists of resources coming up that you can take pictures of. I'm gonna go through the stratum of machine learning expertise from lack of, from not being very familiar with it through to looking for collaborators and places to put your papers. And so first, if you're interested in learning more about machine learning and you have a little bit of reading time on your hands, there are a lot of great online resources. 
Some of these may be familiar. There's a classic machine learning course from Stanford. I have a favorite blog that talks about some of the issues and, and successes of modern machine learning research. And there are a number of good tutorials that will introduce you to widely used machine learning libraries. Um, I recommend the Fast AI course in particular because it'll get you moving in just a few lectures and they have a nice setup of Jupyter Python notebooks that will actually give you some code to start using or to start testing on your own data sets. I'm going to give this a second for the phones. All right. The second category here is machine learning specifically for weather research, earth system science, geoscience, and climate change. These reviews have all come out in the last couple of years. They're representing a lot of work and energy in the history before that. I recommend, um, in a weather sense, I would definitely look at the review by Amy McGovern and co-authors. Um, there is a, pos following that through, there are a number of new views of what Earth system models and Earth system science could look like with deep learning and with the potential for continuous training and data integration. I recommend the one by Marcus Reichstein. Um, the paper here by Gill et al. is a position paper by the NSF-funded group Intelligent Systems for Geosciences. They do a really good job of laying out technical details like the differences in data structures and problems between um, traditional machine learning benchmark data sets and the problems that we encounter a lot in earth science. And then finally here at the bottom is the review paper that I've worked on. This is framed for machine learning experts in particular and it's a holistic approach looking to identify high impact problems in climate change. And then finally, if you have a problem and you're interested in finding collaborators or venues, there are a number of workshops that are quite active and popping up. There's going to be four up here on the screen. The first one I'm going to talk about is the Climate Change AI workshops. We host these at machine learning conferences. There's going to be one at NeurIPS in December and another one coming up at ICLR later this year. And they bring together domain experts and machine learning researchers with a focus on particularly advanced forms of machine learning techniques and a goal of getting machine learning research moving into other scientific domains faster once it comes out. You can also look into the Climate Informatics Group and Workshop. They were hosted here at NCAR for some years, although I believe they're going to be in Paris next time. They're focused on climate science in particular, both machine learning approaches and other mathematical and statistical approaches. And um, you can take a look through their conference advertisements or their past proceedings to get a sense of the work there. I've mentioned a couple of initiatives by intelligent systems and geosciences. They're focused a little bit more on the ground and less up in the weather and climate area. But their website has a really great list of their current projects. So you can take a quick look and see if anything they're currently working on interests you. And then finally, some of you may well be familiar with the American Meteorological Society's Committee on AI for Environmental Science. They're the oldest group here. They've been running for about the last 19 years, and they host a conference at the American Meteorological Society uh, annual meeting, which is going to be in Boston this January, and which is posed to have a much larger AI section than it ever has before, with a lot of interesting workshops, and I think some tutorials. So with those action items done, I'd like to thank a number of the people who have helped me with work in this area and informing some of the content here, the two institutions that have hosted me in the last few months, and the Department of Energy Computational Science Graduate Fellowship for funding everything you saw, what you saw here, and most of my PhD, and ask for questions.